Welcome back and happy Boxing Day, everyone. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Boxing Day, it's something that's not a big deal to us in the U.S. because it comes from an old tradition in Europe. So they know Boxing Day means the 26th of December. When I was a child, I thought they must have had a prize fighting match on the 26th. I had no idea. Turns out this is the day that traditionally the churches opened the poor box and distributed the money to the less fortunate. So it became known as Boxing Day, uh, a major holiday with very pleasant connotations for the poor who would benefit from those boxes. All right, today we have our ongoing Fisher Boy project. And because we are working on something um, that, well, it's Humpty Dumpty and trying to put the pieces back together again. So I thought we would take the opportunity to take a look at one of the most beautiful pieces of glassware to ever grace this planet and the tragedy of what happened to it. So when we get back. Okay, this piece of glassware is my very favorite. I think it's the most beautiful thing ever made in glass. Um, now you're probably looking at it saying, oh, well, it's pretty Sue, but really the best ever. Well, I can tell you something that'll change your mind if you're thinking maybe it isn't. And that is this vase is 2000 years old. Uh, the most widely accepted dates for the creation of this, this is the Portland vase, is between around 5 CE and maybe 20 CE. Some scholars believe it's a little older, um, perhaps 10, 20 BCE. Nevertheless, what we're looking at is 2,000 year old glasswork. And keep in mind, these were people who, um, who have nowhere near the scientific advancements we have, they were dealing with very primitive glassmaking techniques. This is, in my opinion, just staggering, staggering. Now, the tragedy of the Portland vase is, and, and you're going to love this because they know not just the exact date, but the exact time. Three 45 in the afternoon of February 7th in 1845, a drunken Oxford student went into the British Museum, picked up a statue, and smashed it into the glass case that held this beautiful vase. So, uh, they brought the student to court, um, and because of some weird technicality in the paperwork, which may in fact have to do with the, the fact that they probably did not have an accurate valuation on the vase, he was charged with the destruction of the glass case the vase was in. And he was uh, given a fine or a couple of months in jail if he didn't pay the fine. Somebody paid the fine for him anonymously. And the owner of the vase declined to take action against his family because they were very poor and the owner's position on the matter was, well, they didn't do it. Uh, yeah, they had no control over this. You know, the drunken kid did it. Why utterly ruin the family over it? Which I thought was uh, very charitable of him. Now, let's take a look at what it looked like when our friend, by the way, his name was um, a Mulcahy, William Mulcahy. So when William Mulcahy was through with this, this is what it looked like. 
Now, this is a, an artist's rendering of the pieces as they were laid out in 1845. So that's why it looks like a drawing. It's because it is a drawing. The restoration was a major undertaking, as, as you can imagine. Um, the original restoration of from 1845 was redone, I believe, in the 1880s. It was redone again in the 1940s. I, I think it was just after the Second World War. And then redone yet again. Um, and I believe at this time, because this may have been the 90s, I don't recall exactly, when it was redone the final time, they believe that our advances in adhesives were sufficient to ensure that it won't need to be touched for another hundred years or so. Will it have to be redone again? Almost certainly. Um, adhesives are good, but the very nature of the piece now, which is all those tiny shards being glued back together, means eventually it's just going to have to be redone you know, entropy will set in, things will happen, it will have to be redone. So, I thought you might enjoy taking a look at that, because that's what I was reminded of when I started to take a look at the work needed for our little Fisher boy. Now, um, where, where we are at with this at this point is the head of the Fisher boy uh, was empty. What happened with these pieces is they were made in a mold. They poured plaster in the mold, but it wasn't um, solid plaster. They would sort of coat the edge, uh, the interior of the mold with plaster and then fill the rest with, in this case, concrete. And they did that because this was designed to be an outdoor piece. They didn't want it blowing away or getting knocked over easily. However, the concrete did not extend to the Fisher boy's head. The head was totally empty. Now, let me grab this so you can see. This is the neck. And as you can see, this is as far up as the concrete goes. And it just sort of came in, bottlenecked, and stopped. Now, that is unfortunate because when... Uh, the item was damaged in transit, that head, which was a lot more fragile than I had ever imagined. I didn't know that head was empty. I'm not sure how I would have packed it had I known, but I definitely think I would have done something uh, to protect the head a little more because it was virtually like an empty eggshell sitting on top of the package. So when it was damaged, that was it. And we're looking at sort of Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses and all the king's men. Now, this is what the, uh, the Fisher boy's head looked like before I started to work on this restoration. So as you can see, we have a couple of large pieces and a great many very tiny shards. Uh, also, and this is true with our Portland vase as well. There are many little bits and pieces that just were lost. Um, the plaster either shattered right down to powder. Um, it's the pieces. I suspect most of it is the pl plaster just shattered down to powders because I got every piece I could out of the box, but there was a lot of plaster dust left behind. So that's what we're working with. So the first thing I have to do with this is to get the head back in some sort of shape. Now the challenge here is it's very tempting to take the big pieces and glue it together. That's not a plan, because then you might not be able to fit the little tiny pieces in. You have to take it, um, you take a piece and you fit in the pieces 
that go around the edges and you build it out that way. That's how you can do it. And even then, sometimes the way a piece breaks, you're going to have to fit a piece in or, you know, file an edge down. By the way, they did that with the Portland vase too, unfortunately. Um, just to make sure everything goes back together. What I am doing is I am reconstructing the front of the Fisher Boy's head first because the largest of our pieces, um, this piece right here, is the back of his head. And as you can see, it's not quite half. I would say this is probably um, perhaps a little more than a third of our Fisher Boy's head. But that will allow me to put the front together and then pop this in with minimal fussing because it's not going to be a small piece that has to be wedged in. So that is what we are doing. Now let me show you the film of what's gone on up to this point. All right, let's take a look at the head of little Ronnie, our fisher boy. Now, in the event that you do not remember what he looked like before, I have a picture and I'll show you. But what we have here now, this is what we're dealing with. This was the largest single unbroken piece. This is the back of his head. This piece is actually two pieces. You can see the seam right here where I glued the two pieces together. And this is another two-piece section. Again, you can see the seam. Now, the reason I am starting with these larger pieces is because I want to assemble the head in two halves. In other words, build out on this, build out on that, so that I can just push them together. Sort of like slicing an apple in half and shoving it back together. The reason for that is, although I can't show you, if I put these two pieces of head together with the back, there is a hole about the size of a silver dollar on the top of Ronnie's head. And that hole is filled in with these little pieces. And that's going to be a monstrous project. The easiest way to do it is to add these little pieces to the perimeter of the sides I'm working on. It is a difficult uh, hunt and peck, hit and miss project. So, especially because, and these are shards really. So we take this piece here. Now this piece, I don't know if you can see it, is the other side of his nose. I'm going to be able to match this piece to his nose. Um, other pieces, this seems to have the corner of his mouth. I might be able to move this piece into uh, this section of head. Every time I do that, I have to check the fit against all the other pieces. And this is why the job is taking so long. Now, one of the things I can do for this, and this gives me an advantage. Um, if you were doing this on a vase, you'd have the same problem. How do you deal with something hollow? How do you avoid having that, you know, silver dollar sized hole? that you have to fill in with tiny shards. In this case, because it's hollow, but I don't want it to be, this is what I'm using. I am going to take this. This is uh, basically drywall patching uh, compound. And once I have enough of the head together, I am going to fill the head with this. Now, the reason I'm using this product instead of plaster, which is what the head is made of, is this does not shrink. 
so I can load it in and it's going to stay where I put it. If I used plaster, it would shrink and sort of move back from the interior edges and leave a little airspace, which is not going to be helpful to me at all. So that's where we are at this point, and I will fill this in later. Well, let's take a look at this. At this point, I have added three more pieces to the front of little Ronnie's face. That tiny sliver that went in on the other side of his nose, uh, plus a piece right under here at his chin, and then this cheek piece. Um, that piece, by the way, was the one that had the other side of his mouth. As you can see, there's a nice little chunk missing. There is no piece that's going to fill that. I believe that is part of the sort of uh, pl plaster that was beaten to powder in the accident and just ended up as crumbs on the bottom of the box. But that can be filled in, so I'm not too worried about it. It's in a spot where I can easily recreate the original shape. Now, if it was over here on this nice smooth cheek, boy, would that be easy. But it's not as difficult as it might be. So what has to happen now is that glue needs to set up. It needs to dry. The reason for this is if I keep playing around with a piece that for which the glue joints are not solid. I'm just going to break off the pieces that I've already glued. That's going to be a mess because I'm going to have to clean up the seams again, and you just don't want to do that. Once you have a piece in place, let it dry, go on to the next. Now, um, I'm using uh, Loctite glue, and notice this here. Let me get it in my hand. This is the size of the glue that I use. I do this for a reason. I buy uh, super glue in packages. It'll come like four or five of these little itty bitty things in a package. Because when I'm working on a project, I wanna crack a new package of glue open. And I, I don't wanna use old glue, glue that's been exposed to air, glue that's that's less than perfect. I want a brand new container of glue. And of course, I hate wasting a whole lot of glue. But frankly, one way or another, whenever I start a project, I always open a new glue container. Even if that means, you know, the last glue container, you know, which is this big and full of glue, is going to be thrown out. It's just not worth it to me, and glue is cheap enough. But that's why I use these tiny little containers of glue. I use it for all the glue I use. The Gorilla Glue is in a little container like that. And I'll show that to you the next time I, I do a filming on this. Um, my E6000 is in tiny little packages like this. Uh, I, I just don't think there's any need to use old glue that's been sitting around for a month or two on a project you value. All right, we will get back to this after our face sets up a little more. So, now we have most of Ronnie's face together. Remember, we have this large back section, but that's going in last so we don't have to try to fill in tiny little pieces uh, when we complete this. We want to be able to put something large into place. It'll just make it a lot easier for us. Now, we have all of these little pieces, and I'm going to have to go through them one by one, filling in this section, filling in the sections on the top, this section over here. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, and you just stick a piece in, see if it fits. Obviously, that's uh, there are not a whole ton of pieces here. What do we have? Um, it's 
10 pieces. It could be a lot worse. But now that you've seen the bulk of this portion of the restoration, I'm just going to do this on my own, mostly because I don't want you to have to listen to me swearing in frustration when the pieces don't fit right. When we return to the project, I'm going to show you how we're going to use this and how we're going to fix all these. I mean, the cracks are obvious. We've got a gaping hole here. We're going to have to fix that. And so hopefully we'll get all of these little pieces in place and that's what we'll be doing next time. What remains to be done, and I'm, I'm going to do this off camera because, as I said when I was filming, I don't want you to have to hear me swear. I'm going to fit those little pieces in and get it back together as best I can. Then I am going to fill the entire head with a non-shrinking spackle, plaster repair. It's, this is what you would use to fill a hole in your wall because the plaster this boy is made out of is the plaster you would use to, to fill in a plaster wall. Um, the reason that I'm using this chemical, um, or this compound rather, and not actual plaster is because actual plaster would shrink. And I don't want this to shrink. I want to be able to fill that head and when it dries, I, I want it to be rock solid. And this is the way to do it with something that won't shrink. Um, once I have this done, the head is back together and I have stuffed the, um, the joint compound into it. That's when we will get back together and I will show you how I do the repairs. Because right now, that little face has all of its little pieces. Whatever is missing is missing. It's, it's gone. It's not coming back. And that's going to have to be repaired. That has to be filled in. Then the cracks have to be smoothed down, filled in. Um, we Now, and it looks terrible now, I know this. But once this is all done, it can be repainted. The cracks may still be visible as tiny lines, but it won't look like somebody whacked poor little Ronnie in the face with a two by four, which is what it looks like now. So that's where we are with this project. I thought you would like to see the process of this because we've all got stuff that's gotten shattered. Things that we love that might have sentimental value, whatever. And for a lot of us, those pieces are sitting in a shoebox and we're wondering, well, where do you even begin? So this is one of those, I am not promising you an easy project. I'm not promising you a quick project because this is one that can take a very long time. You can get frustrated. If you get frustrated, walk away because that's how you make mistakes. It can drive you completely crazy, but can be done. All right, that's what I have for you today. Once again, happy Boxing Day, and I have a slideshow for you. We are all going to get together again next week, but in the meantime, remember, the, the giveaways are still going on on the SUNY uh, Facebook page, and this is SUNY's Angels, so Go on, check them out. Like I said, we are we are doing the giveaways. Even if the holidays are gone, if the giveaways are still here, we're still doing them. All right, have a terrific day, and I'll see you all next time.